When you're playing sport, there are uniforms, and the idea between these uniforms is that different teams wear different colours. Uh, you see this in the NBA and the NRL and a whole heap of these professional leagues, particularly the colours of the home and the away jersey are very specifically designed to contrast with the rest of the colours in the league. Okay, So they are meant to stand out. Now, when there is no contrast in the sporting team, that's when you get difficulties start to happen. Uh, I used to play Oztag before my shoulders just kept popping out. Um, and in Oztag, we could actually choose our own color for the team. But the problem with that was uh, we would often have one color, say black, and then the other team would also be black. And so you'd be playing the game and you'd throw the ball to someone who you thought was on your team, but they actually were not on your team. And they took the ball, ran the full length of the field and scored a try. But see, with sporting colors, contrast is critical. You are far less effective if there is not contrast. You must look different to them. And as is true in sports, so it is also true in the church. We in the church are different. But then being different, we must stand out and look different to those around us. See, the problem in Corinth and the problem that can still permeate the church today is that the Korean church in Corinth was starting to assimilate. They were starting to take on the colors of the world around them. They were starting to look exactly like them, leading to no contrast between the church and the world. The way that this is specifically happening uh, that Paul is mentioning in 1 Corinthians 5 is that a man was sleeping with his stepmom. Paul then uses this specific uh, event to talk about the need for church discipline, and the need to do so on more than just sexual sin. The idea here is that the church must stand out. There must be a contrast between the church and the world. And as a result, sin must be taken seriously. And church discipline is a method to make that happen. Well, we look at the context. Uh, Paul has just finished talking about the topic of division. He did this in chapters 1 to 4. Um, and then he starts to talk here in chapters 5 and 6 about something else that he had been told, uh, specifically from, likely from someone in Chloe's household mentioned in chapter 1. And the issue is there was a man involved with sexual sin. And Paul is concerned about the man, but he's possibly more concerned about the response of the church. The church was boasting about it. They were proud of their tolerance of this sin. Now, sexual immorality is raised in this chapter, but we'll look at it in a lot more detail next week when we look at 1 Corinthians 6. But it's still worth noting uh, the context of Cor Corinth as a uh, seaport, sex-obsessed city. Uh, specifically, we talked about this uh, before, but there was a big temple uh, to worship Aphrodite, uh, the goddess of love. And the way that you worshipped Aphrodite is by sleeping with a temple prostitute. In Corinth, of course you slept with a prostitute. It's, exact, it's just what you did, of course. What? You don't know. Everybody does it. It's all right. And the problem is those kind of views about sex were starting to infiltrate the church. And that's one of the things that Paul wants to deal with here. Well, we see the sin in verse 1 and 2. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud? Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? A man has his father's wife, the has meaning sex, um, and the father's wife is unlikely to be the man's mum. It's more likely to be uh, the father, his stepmom, the father's new wife, uh, through divorce or through death, uh, or the father's concubine. But either way, it's a big no-go zone. Uh, and it was against the Levitical law. In Leviticus 18, 7 to 8, prohibits uh, incest, or sleeping with someone's mum, including one's stepmom. So what this guy did was wrong, even from an Old Testament perspective. Now, the term for sexual immorality here, used in verse 1, is the Greek term pornea. And it basically includes all violations of the seventh commandment. Uh, you shall not commit adultery basically meaning any sexual sin that took place outside the boundaries of marriage. All premarital, extramarital, and unnatural sexual intercourse. Sex is the goldfish, 
Marriage is the bowl. Keep the goldfish in the bowl. And what made this act stand out, possibly more than others, was that this act was even too far for the non-Christians in Corinth. Uh, even they drew the line at sleeping with your stepmom. Even they were looking at what this guy did and goes, whoa, 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 too far, too far. That's, there's a line, bro, there's a line. But the church, the church was accepting of it. See, you know you've gone too far when people outside the church think that you've gone too far. But the church was actually proud. The church was boasting. Uh, what this, there is sexual sin in Corinth, but then there is what this guy did. And yet the church uh, is not just uh, quiet on it. They're elevating it. You think it's okay? They more than think it's okay. And it's, they're like, guess what I did last night style. Like, how good is this? Like, look at me, look at me. And Paul is like, no, 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 no. You should be grieving and not proclaiming. You should be mourning, not boasting. You're going about this the completely wrong way. Now, one way of taking it is that the Corinthian church was going like, Ours is a broad-minded church. As long as he stays active in the church and does his part, I don't think it's anyone's business what he does in private. Besides, when he's a lot younger, and he's a lot younger, but they're having a meaningful relationship. Who are we to judge? We should be affirming. That is what the church was saying. And you can see echoes of the way the modern church takes a similar view. Uh, a one commentator talked about lines that he had heard in his ministry. Um, he was talking to a, a church deacon once, and the deacon said, well, I think we should get rid of, in the wedding ceremony, this whole death do us part thing. Uh, and another time he was doing a seminar on divorce, and one of the women emphatically stated, I never want to get married again, but I'm not done with sex. And these were Christians inside the church with these views we are losing our ability to be shocked by contrast paul was shocked at what was happening at corinth and he felt that something must be done about it the church must take sin seriously and act differently uh, liz was driving uh, the other day um, and a truck was swerving in and out of traffic and it clipped the car, it actually uh, damaged the side view mirror, um, put a crack in it and, and a scrape in it. And in the car, Liz was sh shocked and, and said, did he just hit us? And the kids were like, whoa, 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 what's going on? But the truck driver was like, do, 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 do. He, he didn't even know what had happened. He didn't even register it. It didn't bump in him. He, he felt nothing. And that's kind of what the church was doing. They should be shocked. They should be startled. But instead, they were going, look, do, 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 do. nothing to see here. And Paul is calling them out for that. Paul takes this sin seriously because the church must take sin seriously. And he calls for a harsh action as a result. Uh, we see this in verse 2b. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? And then again in verse 5, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. The man is to be taken uh, out, literally it is ek mezu, literally translated out of the midst of the Christian believers, out of the midst of the Christian community. And what Paul is asking here is really hardcore, but it is necessary. Side note, the woman in question is not referenced, and this is likely because she wasn't a Christian. Now, in terms of this taking out of the church, the church can be, and historically has been, a little bit trigger-happy in relation to this. But the idea is that the person who is taken out of the church is in flagrant and consistent sin. This isn't referring to someone who is struggling with their sin. Uh, who is putting boundaries and accountability in place in relation to their sin, who is broken by their sin, who is striving to get attraction on their sin. No, this is talking about someone who didn't care about it, was obviously doing it, had no issues with doing it, and wasn't going to stop. See, in, in the past, 
people were like, oh, I don't like that person because he got angry at me once, so boom, we have to kick him out of the church. But that's not who this is referencing. This is referencing the consistent and flagrant sinner. And then note that any taking out of is done, at least in one sense, for the sake of the individual. Verse 5, that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. The goal for the individual of any church action is that the person may repent, that the person may realize what they have done is wrong, get themselves right with God, and then come back into the church. That is the goal, and that the church may accept them and be open to this. And the next thing is that it is the church which does the taking out. Uh, Verse 4, when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present. See, it's not just the church leadership alone that does the taking out, that does the church discipline. It's the church as a whole. It wasn't up to Paul alone. It wasn't up to the overseer or the pastor of the church. Note that it isn't the overseer and the pastors of the church who are being rebuked here. It's the church as a whole. See, the church as a whole needs to do something about this. Not just the leadership, the church. And I think that historically too has got us into problems, leaving the responsibility of any church discipline up to the leadership alone. But rather, the idea is there is a church stance here that is taken, that the church is gathered and say, hey, this is not okay. We're not going to put up with this any longer. And then when this is dealt with, the church doesn't deal with it in a quarrel or a fight. There isn't a lynch mob like the Melbourne protesters that happened this week. And they were to assemble as those who had confessed Jesus is Lord and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so then what does this taking out of look like? Uh, Particularly when Paul says, hand this man over to Satan. Like, that's really hardcore. Like, what is he referring to here? Well, it's not a casting out of the man from God's realm into Satan's realm, but there are links here to what happened with Job, uh, specifically in Job verse 2 and 6, uh, where it says, The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. And this language used uh, here in verse 5 uses the same term used in the Greek translation of Job 2.6. And so Paul has done that um, basically intentionally to bring our mind to what happened with Job. For Job was given by God into Satan's hand for a time. But at the end of that time, he was stronger, more dedicated, had a better understanding of the nature of God as a result. And the, and the goal is that is what happens with this man too. That he goes out of the church for a time, but then realizes what he has done and comes back into the church repentant and is a more strong and mature Christian. God is still in control of the man when he has been taken out of the church. And the only reason and the only reason in relation to the man that the person goes out is that he might come back, that his salvation might be saved. Because the reality is if the man If the church doesn't do anything serious about it, then the result will be the the man can degenerate to the point of no longer being saved. Well, this action needs to be done for the sake of the man, but this action also needs to be done for the sake of the church. We see this in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. Uh, Liz was making pizza bases. We do this from time to time. We have a thermomix, so it makes it a lot easier, so you're not doing these ones. Um, But we didn't have any yeast, which is a key ingredient to the pizza bases. And so we used self-raising flour, but it just didn't work. Uh, The dough didn't rise enough. And then when we cooked them, they were like crumbly and they kind of folded like a calzone quite easily in your hand. Um, But the idea is that when you put in the yeast, you just sprinkle a little bit and then it works into the whole dough. So that when that the whole dough will then rise. The yeast doesn't work on sections of the dough with one chunk of the dough rising and the other chunk not. No, no, no. The yeast affects the entire thing. And a little bit infected everything. 
Well, the yeast that Paul is talking about here is not uh, the sin of the man so much because it's prefaced with, in verse 6, uh, your boasting is not good. And this links with the verse 2 reference to the church and uh, their pride and tolerance of this sin. The yeast Paul is talking about is the fact that they were letting this sin go unabridged, that they were doing loot to do to do with the sin of this man to the point where they were actually proclaiming it. What the Corinthians needed to do was get rid of this yeast, get rid of this sin in their midst to stop its permeation, to stop the damage that it was doing to the Corinthian church. And see, Paul then links this to Passover in verse 7b and 8. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Uh, when Jews celebrated Passover, uh, before the feast, what they would do is they would search through the house and get rid of any leaven or yeast from the house and get rid of it. And there was this process of hunting and searching and then chucking it out. Now, for our family, it basically involves going to the little uh, container of yeast in the deep freeze and putting that in the bin. But for other families, it'd be a lot bigger process. And Paul is saying in the same way you searched out the yeast, do the same thing with this sin of malice and wickedness, with the sin of the toleration of, of, of sin. See, Paul says in verse 7, you are unleavened. You are devoid of yeast. So be the church devoid of yeast. You are purified from the evil which is yours due to your sinful nature. So become what you are. Look at what God has done uh, through Christ in you. Now get with becoming what he has made possible. Uh, the word in Greek in verse 8, translated purity or sincerity, is el elikrenia. Uh, and the emphasis here is not on perfection and sinlessness. Rather, it's about open and honesty, walking in the light of God. Allowing God to shine that light to expose the dark areas of our sin and walking in transparency in the community of God as a result. That is what it looks like to get rid of the yeast. That is what it looks like to be the uh, unleavened bread that we are. Transparency, openness, truthfulness. And that is the goal of the church discipline. And so then how do we apply this in the modern church? I think church discipline has to be an arrow in the church's quill because there is consequences when we do not. And there's consequences when the church tolerates sin. There's consequences for the person and there's consequences for our church. But we will be less effective in ministry if we don't take sin seriously. And even in the history of Clempton Park, there was a situation where a person was asked to no longer attend the church. Now, I don't know the details of that uh, specific scenario. I don't know whether it was right or wrong, but I agree with it in the biblical principle that at times there may be a time where a person needs to come out of the church with the goal being that they will repent and come back in, but we can't tolerate that stuff. And when it, we do, the church becomes toxic. And a lot of unhelpful things occur as a result. With a person like the guy in chapter 5, as long as his friends in the church helped him rationalize what he was doing, made him feel like it was okay for him to continue in this sin, then nothing would change. But if the church took this seriously, if the church sat down with him, if he was able to see his sin through someone else's eyes, then the goal is that he would repent and be saved. And the church would be more powerful in ministry as a result. In our sex-soaked culture, we need to take sexual sin seriously too. And hold people into account when that is not being done. And progressive Christianity, I think, is um, in danger of doing this. Boasting about how tolerant they are of sexual sin. Uh, boasting about the sins of their pastors uh, and the open-mindedness and acceptance. But it results in the dilation of the gospel and the loss of power in effective ministry. Okay. But this taking the person out from the church's midst, why does the not church 
not do this. I mean, there aren't that many examples that I can think of where this has actively been done in a helpful and productive way. Well, I think there's many reasons why this isn't done. Uh, one of the reasons, particularly in relation to big churches, is because people can fall through the cracks. Uh, people aren't honest and open about who they are and what they do, and they go under the radar. Nobody tends to ask them. I have a friend who has been in a church for uh, decades now, um, but he doesn't do ministry. He's not asked to do ministry. The senior pastor has never had a conversation with him. Uh, he could be in significant sin and no one would know, and so he's not put up for church discipline. He's allowed to continue in it. Now, thankfully, with my friend, he's not, but you can see how that would occur. <clears throat> Another problem is that there can be a gap between the leader and the lead. Uh, the leader can be put on a pedestal, and so no one questions what they are doing, even if they are involved in significant sin, and consistent and flagrant, but there's no knowledge of that. And in the same way, the leader doesn't know what the congregation is doing, and so the congregation is happier with that. Another reason that I can think is uh, prevalent, well, relevant to us is that there can be a lack of relationship. And we can come in, do church, leave, but not actually do life with anyone in the church. Not actually know anyone, not know their struggles, not know them really. We can have the conversations about how are you going, uh, but then expecting the answer of good thanks and nothing more. And we don't probe anymore because we don't really want to know. We don't want to do life with openness and transparency in that way. And when someone does that, we often don't know what, how to respond. It can be responded with muteness, with awkwardness. Oh, quickly, let's change the topic to what movies are on, even though I haven't been for the last few years. Rather than saying, well, okay, that's serious. How can I pray with you about this? How can I hold you accountable to this issue that you are going through? We must be able to do life as Christian believers. If no one in the church knows what's going on in your life, then we're doing church wrong. And that's on us. But that might also be on you. We need to head towards being an open and honest fellowship that shares our life with each other and walks through the dark times with each other and holds each other accountable to their sin. And I can think of many ways that we as a church have done this and we need to continue to strive for it. But there also may be a time for discipline. Um, there was an, a, a child uh, did a certain act this week uh, that we had to come down on them harshly for. They'd done it a couple of times, but this time was egregious. Uh, and so we needed a big punishment for them. And I, I don't like disciplining my kids. And my kids definitely don't like being disciplined. They were not happy with the discipline that they were given. But what happens if I don't? Like, if I don't, that issue that my child may have will just skyrocket and will in, envelop them and do major damage for them, but also for all of those around them. No, I don't want that for my child, and I don't want that for the, ch uh, for the people that love my child, and so I will discipline my child in order to get better behavior out of them, for them to be the person that they, I know they can be. And we all know children that have not been disciplined, children who have never been told no, and children that do not know the meaning of uh, the time out corner and the damage that they have done in their life as a result. Our, in child rearing, we need discipline. In church, we need to have the option of discipline. The church needs to take sin seriously. And then when church discipline does occur, it must be done in love and care and concern. Uh, one commentator told a story of deacons like secret agents peeking through a window at school dances to record the names of the ch uh, church youth who attended the school dance. And then on the Sunday morning, those names were read out from the pulpit uh, with the idea of discipline from the church on those children. It's like, no, no, that is not the goal. That is not what Paul is talking about here. That is not a helpful process. A, a pro more helpful process? Matthew 18. One person talking to the person with the sin, then two people talking to the person with sin, and then the church talking to the person with the sin, and then an action occurring as a result. The 
Church discipline must be taken seriously, um, but it's not then uh, an excuse to do more damage. Uh, when I was a young adult, a uh, Christian young woman uh, had uh, sex outside of marriage and she became pregnant. Um, and she was a part of our congregation. And the way that the church leadership dealt with this is they got the whole church and uh, the lady uh, apologised, uh, repented publicly, confessed publicly and uh, apologised to us as a church uh, for what had happened. And then she asked for our church's help and support in raising the child. And I can't think of a better time that a church has dealt with sin. And we did. And it was a beautiful moment. The church did help with the raising of that child. It was a positive experience. Uh, but it's not often how it goes. It's often marred in hearsay and rumours and rumblings and whispers and downturned glances and raised eyebrows. That is not walking in openness and truth, in transparency and sincerity. The church must take sin, serious, sin seriously and church discipline is one aspect of this. But when it is done, it is done for the sake of the person that they may continue to be saved is done for the sake of the whole church, for flagrant and consistent sin, and in love and grace, with the person's ultimate salvation in mind. Then in the remainder of this chapter, in verses 9 to 13, Paul opens up the possibility of church discipline, not just for sexual sin, but for a range of other sins as well that were occurring both in the church and in the world at the time. We see this best through verse 11, but now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. Now here, it winds out the cases other than just sexual sin. And in doing so, Paul is not trying to create a hierarchy of sin, of what sin is worse than the other, but rather in verse 10 and 11, he's referring to naturally occurring sins in the church. And each must be taken seriously, not one as worse than the other ones that were occurring. Um, they are both, all should be considered in terms of flagrant and consistent sin. Now this Let's have a look at this list. The first one is greed. Uh, the Greek word is pleonexia, which means grasping and grasping for more, wanting more and more and never being satisfied and wanting discontentment is part of this. That is greed. That is a sin that needs to be taken seriously as well. Idolatry. Uh, the idea of our modern world, we don't worship gods, uh, but we do worship sport. We do worship consumerism. Uh, we do worship success and fashion, uh, production, private property, results. These are the idols of our modern society. This is the character of the society that we live in that the church needs to stand in contrast of. For there is only one true God worthy of worship. Uh, the slanderer um, or reviler is another way it's uh, termed. Uh, this is an abusive person. Uh, one who is constantly critical, running down everything in the Christian community. Uh, the word in Greek has specific meaning of reviling those in leadership and tearing them down. Oh, I don't like it when the pastor did this. Oh, the deacon should deal with this. Oh, can you believe what that man said? Oh, that is a reviler. That is a slanderer. Uh, but it's not just for um, tearing down the leadership of the church. It's also tearing down for those who have authority that God has given uh, us. Um, I'm not loving at the moment uh, where Christians uh, on social media in relation to COVID are sowing distrust in the government, are calling government information propaganda. Um, that, I think there are times where a Christian must question their government uh, and the authority that they have. I can think of a number of examples where that is a, a legitimate case. The way our government is dealing with COVID, I don't think is, is one of them. And so to sow uh, doubt in the authorities that God has given us in this way, I don't think is a helpful or Christian thing to do and would fall into this category. Uh, drunkenness is another one. Uh, regularly guilty of being getting drunk. Um, swindler, 
uh, here the Greek word is harpax, which has a clear connotation of violence. And violence is becoming so flagrant in our world. Um, you know, ultimate fighting champion uh, and wrestling. Wrestling is entertainment, but you know what I mean? Like it, it's happening more and more. And often through Instagram, I will see uh, fights just breaking out over the silliest things in the takeout restaurants or on the street, on the road, uh, people getting angry and then starting to throw things and belt things and hit things and violence is never okay for a Christian. Not in those terms. We should never be prone to violence as Christians. And when we are, it must be taken seriously. The Christian is to be distinctive in all of these areas. Greed, idolatry, uh, slandering, drunkenness, swindling violence. We as the church must stand out. We as the church must be different. In the church, the goal is that there is strict discipline within and then freedom of association for those who are out. Uh, in verse 9, uh, Paul makes a correction. He'd written a previous letter and the church uh, believed that Paul was saying that you can't eat with anyone who is sinful. You can't eat with anyone who is immoral. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. You just can't do it with Christians who are immoral, with Christians who are sinful. For we are to be salt and light. Purity within the church and open-ended mixing for those who are without. And Jesus was the perfect example of this. He was different. He was often accused of being a, a, a glutton and a drunkard because he hung out with tax collectors and sinners. The Corinthian church was not distinctive. The Corinthian church was not salt and light. They were lax about Christian standards and behaviors. And not only that, they were arrogant about it, boasting about it. Look how open I am as a Christian. Look how lax on sin I am. But a blindness to the seriousness of sin, coupled with a refusal to see it, will lead to ineffective ministry, will lead to a degradation in spiritual maturity to the point where people may lose their faith. When we go weak on sin, we become less effective in ministry. What happens when we don't deal with it? It does damage to that person, it does damage to the rest of us. I was thinking um, of a, a specific toxic church that I am aware of, and I was wondering how different that church would have been if this was taken seriously. Um, the people in that situation were not, uh, not doing sexual sin, but they were doing some of the others that were mentioned. What would that church have looked like differently if the church as a whole went, hey, you're doing something and it's against God. You're doing something and it's against Jesus. You need to stop it or you need to leave for a time. Hopefully you will see that you're, what you're doing is wrong and repent and come back into the church, but this is not okay. See, the core of this is that we as a church must take sin seriously. We must take it amongst ourselves. We must take it in the church. And then when there is the situation of a flagrant and consistent sinner, we must do something about it. In love, in care and concern, biblically, but we can't ignore it. And we definitely can't boast about it. Please, let me pray. Lord, with this issue, the church has got it wrong so many times. We either go too hard or too soft. Help us to find the middle ground, Lord. Help us as Clempton Park Baptist Church to take sin seriously and to deal with it in our midst when it is flagrant and consistent. Show us how to do that in openness and love. Show us how to do that in care and concern. Enable us to do that only uh, so that the person may not lose their faith, but also that the church may be effective and powerful in ministry. Lord, help us to take our sins seriously too and draw to mind uh, situations or areas that we need to change as a result. We thank you, Lord, for this time, but we pray, Lord, that you may enable us to act differently in, in regards to this with openness and sincerity, truthfulness and transparency. In your name, amen.